I want to talk to you about sustainability management, which is a field uh, that I'm uh, part of a group that's been creating uh, over the last decade. Uh, and the challenge of sustainability and how we think about it uh, in the programs that I work in and, and the profession that I'm trying to build. Uh, talk about energy. Energy is the core issue of sustainability. In essence, if you solve the energy problem, uh, you, the other problems can be uh, much more easily solved. Um, and something that most people don't want to talk about a lot these days, which is government. Uh, if we're going to solve the problem of sustainability, we actually need a partnership between the public and private sectors. Uh, we're doing that fairly effectively at the local level all over the country. Uh, but in Washington, uh, our Congress doesn't seem to understand that they're actually supposed to legislate. And uh, this is a very difficult problem when you try to have national sustainability policy. We haven't had a new piece of major environmental le legislation in the United States since 1990. If it wasn't for the Clean Air Act of 1970, uh, we wouldn't be able to regulate greenhouse gases. And so uh, it's very, very important that government play a role. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the issue of climate resiliency, which is uh, an issue of very great importance out here. Uh, I have a summer home in Long Beach, New York, a little bit further to the west. And uh, Long Beach uh, got hit very hard by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and hopefully we've learned some lessons. And I'll talk a little bit about the place I work in New York uh, the, at the Earth Institute. So what is sustainability management? Well, what is sustainability? Now this is a, uh, a definition lots of people have heard before. It's from the Brundtland Commission. Uh, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's pretty obvious. What's the management part about this? Well, the management part is organizational practices that result in sustainable development. In other words, if we're going to have sustainability, it's organizations businesses, nonprofits, universities, schools, uh, eventually households that have to act. And so this, it, it, to some considerable degree, we have to translate these concepts into behaviors at the organizational level and at the individual level. And so it is really economic production and consumption that minimizes environmental impact and maximizes resource conservation and reuse. It's important to understand that with 7 billion people on the planet growing to probably 9 or 10 billion, uh, we cannot go back to nature. Uh, there's too many of us, there's not enough nature. But we have to figure out a way to live on this planet without destroying nature because we are biological creatures. We need air, we need water, we need food, and we don't get that without functioning ecosystems. And so how do we manage, again that word management, this high throughput economy uh, without uh, destroying the planet? That's the question. So an interconnected set of problems remain at the heart of the world's environmental crisis. Due to population growth, economic growth, material consumption, and ignorance, the human impact on environmental systems threatens the very existence of those systems. So the solution is something we're starting to call sustainability. And what is that? Well, first, we have to learn a lot more about the planet. You know, part of the Earth Institute is something called the Lamont Darity Earth Observatory. We have environmental scientists all over the world, all over America, trying to understand the basics of what is the impact of human behavior on ecology? What is happening to our ecosystems? You would think we know a lot about it. We know a lot more than we did 20, 30, 40 years ago, but our ignorance is still fairly profound. We need to learn a lot more than we know. So earth observation. The second uh, part of sustainability is regulation. Once we know what we're doing to the planet, we have to figure out ways of containing our impact. Now, We've actually started to do this. And we've been doing it fairly effectively. So this is the positive message. In 1940, 50, 60, 70, you see the GDP of America going up, and you see pollutant loads going up, in some cases faster than the GDP is going up. 
And then a funny thing happens around 1980, after 10 years of EPA's existence. The pollutant loads start to go down. And it's not just that we started exporting pollution to other places, although that's part of what happened. A lot of what happened is we learned how to apply technology to some of, our, some of the worst pollution that we, were, that we were involved in creating. So I live in Manhattan. There's a sewage treatment plant uh, on 137th Street, the North River plant. Before that plant existed, do you know where Manhattan sewage went? directly from big pipes right into the Hudson. I once heard an engineer at the environmental agency say to me, well, the Hudson is like the biggest toilet in the world, and it has great flushing action. I said, oh, great. There's a reason why Riverside Drive is a quarter mile from the river. You wouldn't want to get very close to that river on a hot summer day, and nobody did. There's a reason why the most expensive residential real estate in Manhattan historically was Park Avenue and Fifth Avenue. Those are the two boulevards furthest from the water. So we started to treat sewage. And now what happens? You have not the most interesting architecture, but you have apartment buildings going up along the, the waterfront. You can ride your bicycle right next to the water. You can hike or swim if you want to in the Hudson. Uh, all of that happened because we applied technology to the problem of sewage treatment. Same thing with catalytic converters in cars, scrubbers on power plants. Now, none of this made it pristine or perfect, but all of it reduced the pollutant loads. And so, in fact, the air in New York City today is better than it was in 1970. And the economy of the, of, and the population of this country has continued to grow. And so, there's a lesson there, which is the lesson is we can actually do this. Uh, we're never going to make it perfect. We're never going to make it pristine, but we can make it a whole lot better than it is right now if we apply technology and reason and regulation. So we need regulation. And then we need sustainability management, which is that each organization has to think about what are we doing in our use of resources, in other words, how much energy, how much water, what materials are we using, what happens to those materials when we finish using them, both in terms of the production process of what we make and the consumption process. So it's not enough for me to worry about my factory if I happen to make iPhones. I better worry about that electronic waste when the iPhone gets disposed of at the end of its product cycle, all of which can be done. You know, you want to make sure the iPhone doesn't end up in a, in a landfill? When the next iPhone 10 comes out, give the person $50 to give you back the old iPhone 9. And then you have control of that product through its product cycle. Hewlett Packard does that with toner. When you finish using your toner, uh, UPS comes to our office and picks up the toner and brings it back to Texas where they put more toner in it. Those are the kinds of management practices that can close the cycle on production. And they're the kinds of things I'm talking about when I talk about sustainability management. The characteristics of sustainability management are to think about the long term instead of just focusing on weekly, quarterly, and daily reports. Now, one of the problems with, one of the, problems with the modern uh, information age is that we have a 24-7 economy. Information comes in day and night. And so decision making uh, is subject to these momentary day-to-day -day influences. People are moving herd-like. You've seen it in the market in the last week. One direction, another direction. Information comes in and people act before they think. And so there are many wonderful things about the information age we're in that we now have information that we can manage against. But we've lost the ability to, to step back and think and reflect, which is necessary for something like sustainability. Now, I think that, as I say here, effective management is sustainability management, that you have to think about these physical issues as inputs into decision making. Now, in the average business, people think about profit and loss, return on equity. They think about marketing. They think about communication strategy. Do, does a, the average manager think about these issues of environment and material use. 
One of the things that we're discovering is more and more they are thinking about it. And they're thinking about it for two reasons. The cost structure is changing. Energy and water and materials cost more. And their kids are bothering them. The kids are saying to them, why aren't you paying attention? I've got to live on that planet 20, 30, 40 years from now. You know, when you're gone, I'm going to be the one that has to deal with these issues. And so we are actually seeing a generational shift in many organizations, the internal push for paying attention to these issues is coming from young people. So in terms of pure organizational management, um, if you think about it, if you use less resources to make the same product and you don't throw out stuff and you use it again, you can in fact contain cost in a much uh, more effective way. The issue often is that some of the things that we're talking about of reuse requires energy. In other words, energy is going to be at the heart of many of the problems uh, that we have to deal with. Now, right now, managing the planet is beyond our capacity. Um, but the field of sustainability management is about trying to figure out how to do that. How do we manage our economy? How do we continue to have the high level of quality of life that people enjoy and people all over the world see and want without destroying the planet. If we continue on the current path, we will destroy the planet. But we don't have to. We don't need to. And I suspect we won't. And the reason I suspect we won't is that human beings are ingenious and we're not suicidal. Now, you might say that's an article of faith, but I actually believe, well, first I know they're ingenious because we figure out things all the time. I believe we're not suicidal. There are some evidences that there are certain groups in the world that might be, but in general we're not. Um, one of the pieces of evidence which I, I don't really like to talk about very often, but I'll mention here, is we dropped nuclear bombs in Japan in the mid-1940s. It terrified the world, and we haven't done it since. And so we're now 70 years from the point that we did that. If we were suicidal, conflicts would be ending in nuclear exchanges all the time. So I believe that we understand uh, what's at stake here. Not everybody. The goal of sustainability management is to develop a way to maintain and improve our quality of life without destroying the planet. And to do that, we need natural resources that are maintained. We need technology. We need organizations that know how to learn and know how to do these things. And we need political will and we need leadership. We have the potential to begin a sustainable green economic era to accomplish that. There are a few prerequisites. The first, by the way, is peace. In other words, if we do have a nuclear exchange, if a dirty bomb goes off in Times Square, all bets are off. Uh, then we are in, in very, very deep trouble. And so there needs to be uh, a commitment to peace uh, as a prerequisite to a sustainable planet. The other issue is population and poverty. Now, since the Millennium Development Goals were, were proposed and uh, put into place uh, at, uh, 15 years ago, the level of extreme poverty in the world has actually gone down fairly substantially. Uh, not eliminated by any means, but it has gone down. Um, and I think that's very important because it's important not just because of the ethical uh, imperative of, of getting rid of extreme poverty. I mean, the idea that children go to bed hungry at night is unethical, it's immoral, especially on a planet when we actually grow more food uh, than we could possibly eat. And so uh, that's really, uh, it's important from an ethical perspective, but it's actually important from a sustainability perspective. And here's why. Uh, I don't like to talk about this very often either, especially if my, my two daughters are in the room. But in fact, children used to be an economic necessity and an asset. In the rural times, you had children to work the farm and as your social security. So people had a lot of children because it was how you made sure that, that you, as you got older, were taken care of. Now, children, sociologists use the term, uh, are decorative. We love them, they're helpful, uh, we want them around, but we don't expect a return on our investment. 
Okay. I know that, I, again, I have two beautiful daughters. I love them very much. Uh, all of the income flow has been out toward them. <laughs> I don't expect any of it to come back toward me. And, and so what that has done uh, in the West, it, ha it has reduced population growth. And it's actually reduced population growth in parts of the Middle East and even in parts of Africa. As development, as urbanization comes in, as development comes in, uh, population tends to go down as long as you have some other conditions like family planning and, and health care and so forth. Uh, Japan, you may have read last week, has uh, whole communities uh, that uh, are being abandoned because they, they're no longer replacing their population. That's true in Western Europe. It would be true in the United States were it not for immigration. So poor Donald Trump would have nobody going to his hotels or casinos <laughs> if we had no immigration. Immigration is actually uh, very important uh, for a variety of things. I'm, again, it's not the major topic I want to talk about today, but part of the way economics has changed is we now have what, what some of us call a brain-based economy which is to say that most of the value added in our economic world comes from ideas and from, uh, from activities that aren't related to the basics of providing food, clothing, and shelter. So in 1900 in the United States, 40% of the people worked in agriculture. This year, it's 1.1%, okay? Um, we have invented a whole set of professions that didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago. At the Earth Institute, I have three full-time events managers. There wasn't a profession called events management 20 years ago. Uh, but part of what's happened is that people, as they go to events, expect a higher level of service. They want to have sound and, and light and comfort, uh, and also a, a certain amount of efficiency and effectiveness. There are whole bits of work in the work world that didn't exist a generation or two ago. Fracking, deep sea uh, oil drilling, it's not good for ecosystems. No matter what you say or how you do it, it's not good. Then you've got to transport it and then you've got to burn it. And burning it causes all sorts of pollution and of course, the most important one that we're paying a lot of attention to now is greenhouse gases. And so uh, as we see the effect of climate change, a global problem, a tough political problem, one of, the, one of the good things about most environmental problems is you can see them and you can smell them, like the sewage in the Hudson. Climate is a problem that's created everywhere. Its impacts are largely in the future, and you can't see or smell them. Now, air pollution you can. So I spent uh, a few weeks in June talking to decision makers in Beijing about their uh, air pollution problem. The problem in China is incredibly bad air pollution, mostly from coal-fired power plants. That's also having an impact on greenhouse gases, but the political problem is that nobody wants to live in Beijing because the air is so bad. And the elite in China has to live in Beijing because the party's there, the media's there, the economy's there, and the government's there. And so one of the most urgent movements in the elite part of China, the decision makers, is trying to figure out how to get rid of coal-fired power plants with anything else as fast as they can do it. Because they need to grow their economy, they're, they're under incredible stress uh, to do that, but they have to do it in, in a cleaner way. So energy is, is critical. Uh, ecological footprint, how we have to learn how to reduce the damage we do to the environment. We have to design with durability, reuse, and recyclability in mind when we manufacture the items that we use in our economy. We need to develop a lot of new technologies. Some of them are being developed right now. You probably have seen how we can now use wastewater uh, as drinking water. Uh, that's going to be very important. Uh, because uh, of the, the impact of climate change is going to be to shift where the water is and how easily accessible it is. And so we're going to need to be much more effective at reusing the water that we use. We need to learn how to use waste as a reusable commodity. So in New York City right now, uh, we're trying to begin the process of separating food waste from the, west of the rest of the waste stream. 
you can take the food waste and bring it to something called an anaerobic digester, which is a technological form of a composting system. That anaerobic digester creates fertilizer, the fertilizer that can be used to grow food. Closing those, that system is, is critical to sustainability, in, particularly in the area of food. Um, and, and again, on energy, uh, we absolutely have to figure out either solar energy or some kind of nuclear energy that is, has, has to meet two criteria for me, because uh, I worked in the nuclear waste program. First, it can't create a waste, and secondly, it can't be uh, turned into a bomb. So if we're going to use nuclear, it has to meet those two criteria. Otherwise, it's too dangerous a technology. Not that the power plants are going to start melting down left and right, but the problem with, the, with nuclear technology as it now exists is that it's run by human beings. And the technology may work really well, but human beings mess up. Uh, and so we need technologies uh, for sustainability where the, even if the potential for a catastrophe is low, if there's going to be a major mistake, it can't have the kind of impact that we saw uh, after Fukushima. And so I, I do believe there are ways of, you know, the people I work with at Columbia tell me that we can make a safe form of nuclear power, we just haven't done it yet. Uh, I think we're a lot closer on solar, frankly. And then we have to implement these new technologies. Um, we need to generate the capital. We need to figure out ways of moving the economy in the direction of using renewable energy and of using renewable resources. And you might say, well, what does government have to do with this? Okay, you know, the, the line you often hear in politics, well, government's not good at picking winners. It's true, government's not good at picking winners uh, and, and making investments. But here's what government's really good at. Government's really good at mass mobilization and creating incentives for behavior. And I'll give you the, the classic example that I always use, which is before World War II, Americans were a nation of renters. Most people in the United States rented their home. By the 1960s, the number of owners was approaching 70%. What changed things? The deductibility of mortgage interest, the deductibility of property tax, and the development of a guaranteed mortgage, of an insured mortgage. And so now you could put 10% down and you could then uh, buy a house. And so we moved this country from a nation of renters to a nation of owners through public policy. And we made some mistakes along the way. Uh, the interstate highway system spread out our development and pretty much destroyed our cities for 20 or 30 years. So you can actually move things in the wrong direction. But government, through its, through its policies and its investments, can have a tremendous impact. So imagine if we made those solar arrays that are now becoming competitive, if we gave people a, tax, a, a permanent tax credit or tax deduction for installing them, if we gave businesses uh, incentives for waste reduction and recycling built into the, baked right into the tax code so that uh, you're able to make more money if you do the right thing environmentally. Now, these are not complicated ideas. They just have to be done. And we're in a period of time, unfortunately, where, where government is not working on these things. Um, and that's at least at the federal level. So sustainability management needs incentives to change behavior. Some of those come from government, uh, resources, and new thinking about resources uh, and waste. Integrating sustainability into organization strategy. So whether it's a university, or it's a city, or it's a business, it becomes part of how you think about what you're doing. A company like Walmart is doing this. Walmart requires their suppliers to demonstrate throughout their supply chain how they've accounted for a whole series of sustainability metrics, including energy use, uh, pollution impact, use of water, use of materials. Government could do the same thing. When government buys something, government procurement is a very big part of our economy. Why isn't sustainability part of the criteria for what government purchases. If that happened, that would also drive the economy in that direction. And so those are the kinds of things uh, that we need to do in general. I want to talk a little bit now about energy. If we solve the energy problem, we solve the climate problem. With a growing population, increased energy use, energy demand is increasing 
every year, all the time. If you look at China, over a billion people, look at India, over a billion people, what happens? They see through the internet the way we live here. And guess what? They want it. They want it very badly. And that creates a political pressure on the decision makers in China and India to deliver that economic development if they're going to stay in power. So we have this tremendous pressure. If you, if you could figure out a way to power their homes and the appliances and the vehicles with renewable energy, um, you could then uh, reduce the dependence on fossil fuels and reduce a lot of the damage to ecosystems that is going on right now. Unless we end our dependence on fossil fuels, we cannot develop a long-term sustainable economy. I talked about these issues before. I'm not going to repeat it. Renewable energy has the potential to transform uh, the energy business. We need to develop a form of energy that's cheaper, less capital intensive, more reliable, decentralized, less polluting, and dangerous than fossil fuels. And the idea here, and this is where I sometimes get in trouble with some of my colleagues, I'm against carbon taxes, I'm against raising the prices of fossil fuels. I'm in favor of lowering the prices of renewable energy and lowering the price of energy in general. Energy is so important to our way of life uh, that it permeates the economy. It permeates everybody's daily life. And it, it, one way you, could, you can judge that is think about what life was like for the people that you know that lost power after Hurricane Sandy. You know, teenage kids were walking around the house, you know, not sure what to do. This happens to me at work. If the internet goes down for an hour, you know, my younger staff doesn't know how to work. What am I supposed to do? I have no internet. Well, you, here's a piece of paper, here's a pencil. We used to use those things. You could actually turn around and talk to the person in the next cubicle instead of texting them. They can hear you. Uh, there are a lot of things human beings can do without energy, but uh, we seem to have forgotten what most of those things are. Um, but energy is so important, and, is, and the need for these devices and this entertainment and this stimulation uh, is really a part of modern life, and it's not going away. Now, there's a part of me that wishes a piece of it would go away, because I think sometimes it's tremendously distracting. Uh, if you walk the streets of Manhattan, uh, you have to be careful people don't bump into you because they're looking down at their smartphones. I mean, driving out here today, uh, th I saw there's a, a place to pull over to text, uh, you know, so that you don't do it while you're driving. So there is, uh, you know, let's admit that these devices and this stimulation is really a part of modern life, and, and we are addicted to it. So that's the use part. The part in terms of our impact on the environment is it's changing our climate. And climate change has been going on for millions of years. There's no question about it. But we are heating up this planet at a ferocious rate. And the impact of that heat is not predictable. We don't really know what's going to happen. That's what's a little bit terrifying because we have built infrastructure, whether it's a community like this, or lower Manhattan, or a farm that depends on a certain amount of rainfall, or a certain kind of system of, of, of irrigation, and you m change those weather patterns radically and quickly, and you're risking uh, tremendous damage uh, to the investments we've made over the past century in our way of life. So fossil fuel use has to end. There is no alternative to that. Now, there is one technology that could fix it, which is carbon capture and storage. You know, it's basically sucking the carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, I have friends working on it, and it shows some potential, but again, I think it's a long way off, and I don't think it's the kind of thing uh, that we're gonna, that's gonna work. I think we're much better off, and we're much further along in developing uh, renewable energy. We're only a breakthrough or two away from a new age of decentralized energy technology. According to the Department of Energy, renewable energy electricity generation for technologies that are commercially available today in combination with a more flexible electric system, meaning smart grids, 
uh, we could end up with 80% of our electrical supply coming from renewables by 2050. Um, this is a very important technological challenge for this country uh, and, for the, and for the whole world. The need to transition off of fossil fuels is the central, most important uh, sustainability issue that we face. Um, and there are lots of forces arrayed politically to prevent that. Some of them are called the Koch brothers, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, in a sense, I don't want to sound too deterministic about this, but I think this is really inevitable. Uh, I think that this technological change is going to come and we're beginning to see it. And when it comes, it's going to be a little bit like uh, the smartphone revolution, uh, the cell phone revolution. One of the questions I used to ask, because I'm, I'm very interested in how new technologies uh, get diffused through society uh, and through economies. So I used to ask in my, I teach a course called Sustainability Management, about 150 students every fall semester. I would ask the students, how many of you have landlines in your dorm rooms or in your apartments? So 10 years ago, you know, a pretty big group said yes. The last three years, the, the answer has been zero, okay? So we didn't regulate landlines out of households. These things drove them from the marketplace. So imagine if you had a solar array that was the size of a window and a battery the size of this laptop, and that array in, in New York City could power your home for, uh, for a, a week with the battery power that you could store. Uh, the engineers I work with say that with nanotechnology and solar cells, it's possible to do that. The battery technology, people are working on day and night, and we're seeing dramatic improvements in that technology right now. And so, of all of the technological breakthroughs we need, energy storage and solar rece receptors, uh, those two single technologies, those two technologies could be transformative and could change the way people live. If you were generating your own energy and you could then power your electric car through the energy that you generate, if you had smart grid technology where we sent energy to the grid and from the grid, we wouldn't have to build new power plants, we could close down all those coal-fired power plants uh, that uh, will be closed down anyway due to the regulation uh, that President Obama just issued. Uh, so that technology uh, is at the center of, I believe, solving the sustainability problem. So let me talk a little bit more about government uh, and, uh, and then try to wrap up and see if we have some time for discussion. Do we do questions and answers here? Yeah. Okay. So I, don't, I think I've said enough provocative things probably so far. So why do we need public policy? The market and the hidden hand is not enough. Neither is government, by the way. Government can't do it either. We need a partnership. We need our federal government back in the game. Government has long had a role in building infrastructure and other public goods. The role of government in, in our economy is often not really acknowledged by the political players today. So I'll give you a few examples of what I mean by that. What created the first great wealth in America? It was American agriculture. Where did that come from? Something called the land grant colleges. The federal government gave away land to states in return for states building agricultural colleges. In New York it's Cornell, in Pennsylvania it's Penn State. Those agricultural colleges were required to do agricultural extension to not only do research in agriculture, but train farmers in the latest technique. That created a tremendous surplus of agricultural goods that we were able to sell to other parts of the world. That was one of the ways we created capital in America. The other way, uh, which is one that, that is, is less idealistic, was slavery, uh, which uh, fortunately we were able to end. But agricultural innovation has never ended. We're still doing it here. The other thing, the other piece of infrastructure I'll talk about is the Erie Canal. This is one of my favorite infrastructure stories. So DeWitt Clinton um, wanted to figure out a way to get the agricultural produce from upstate New York and from the Midwest to come through the port of New York. If you look at a map of the United States, the great American port should have been New Orleans, but it was New York. Why? Because DeWitt Clinton built the Erie Canal, 
So from the Hudson, he went west to Lake Erie and was able to open up the entire Midwest to the port of New York. Now, how did he do that? Well, first he went to Thomas Jefferson and said, the federal government should build this. Jefferson was against the federal government spending money. Sound familiar? So what Clinton did is he went to private investors and essentially did the first municipal bond. By the time the canal was finished, it was already paid for. It so reduced the price of shipping produce from upstate New York that he was able to pay off the bonds about, the, 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 they weren't really bonds, they were loans, about 10 years ahead of time. Infrastructure, investment in infrastructure by the government has been a part of our economic life from the beginning of this country and it continues to this day. You know, the GPS in your car, uh, the small, uh, the shrinking of computers, the internet, those were Defense Department projects. The basic research was done in American research universities that created those in innovations that eventually have transformed the world. Why did we shrink computers? When I was in graduate school, which wasn't that long ago, it was 1970s, the computer I used was the size of the screen and it had less computing power than this. Why did we shrink computers? Well, unfortunately, the reason is not very idealistic. We shrunk them so that when we, when we sent our ICBMs to Moscow, they didn't hit Paris. Uh, we, that's, the, that's basically the reason why computers got shrunk. Then we put them on the, the Mercury rockets and the Gemini and the Apollo. It was useful for, for uh, man flight as well. But we shrunk computers and we developed that technology essentially for the defense industry. Why did we do the internet? The internet was so that defense computers could share information from defense lab to defense lab. And by the way, Al Gore did invent the internet. This is a, Al Gore was on the committee that looked at this technology and said this should become commercialized. And so he sponsored the legislation that eventually resulted in the internet technology becoming public use. So poor Al Gore, should, you know, people had known the truth, who knows what might have happened. So government has played, a, has played a role in infrastructure and we need to do that on sustainability technologies. Sustainability management is emerging. It's happening all over the world. The private sector has a, a very important role to play because when the technologies become commercial, that's the moment that you want it in the private sector. So I don't think that you know, the Department of Energy could build an iPhone. I think Apple is much better at that, okay? So we need to have a system where we get sophisticated about what can be done by government and what can be done by the private sector. American economic growth has long depended on this and, and for this to continue, we need a functioning federal government, which unfortunately we don't really have right now. Let me talk a little bit more about the role of government, again, to summarize it. First, funding basic science. Applied science, yes, industry can do that itself. But basic science, before it has an economic use, that has to be done by the government. At the Earth Institute, uh, we have about 80% of our science funding comes from, the, from NASA, NOAA, the National Science Foundation, and the National Institutes of Health. This is over $100 million a year of funding. Without the federal government, that basic work simply would not get done. And that work is really very, very important because at some point those basic inventions, in many cases, first we understand the world better, but also they get translated into new products and new technologies that in fact can transform our lives. We need to fund infrastructure. I've talked about that. The, the real infrastructure investment we need right now is smart grid technology. The technology of our electrical grid is 100 years old. It really has to be updated. We need to decentralize it. We need to make it more uh, resilient and more decentralized. I've talked about rules and metrics. I think I'm going to skip over this. Uh, I think I've talked about most of this. Let me talk about here and climate and resiliency and conclude with that. Climate adaptation is what we've been talking about lately. What's happened 
is we already have climate change going on. And so we now have to talk about not just mitigating climate change, but adapting to it, resiliency. So in Long Beach, where my summer home is, you now, if you want to build a new home, it has to be eight feet high. The heating units, the air conditioning units, the electrical stuff all has to be up, assuming a flood's going to come through. Same thing is true in the building code in New York now. If you're in the, in the flood zone, uh, you're not building uh, in the basements of these buildings. You're not putting your utilities there anymore. They're going on the second floor. The basements are now being used for other uses that can absorb water uh, if necessary. Lots of funding has been spent already in this region to build resiliency. Uh, we're doing dune restoration. We're doing uh, seawalls. We are changing the way we're building. We're starting to think about how do we, uh, particularly our, our energy and our sewage treatment and our water filtration systems have to be built in such a way that they can resist uh, the impact of storms. Hurricane Sandy for this region was an eye-opener for our governments. Um, and it, it has changed the way uh, basic land use planning is taking place now. This is one of the things that gives me a sense of hope uh, because we did learn from this particular event. We're very good in this region at what I call first response. You know that's the 10th anniversary of Katrina where thousands of people died. We don't even know how many people died actually. Um, Hurricane Sandy in this region, fewer than 100 people died. And part of the reason for that was because of the, the excellent first response of our government, of our emergency response people, the evacuations that were done, some of them incredibly heroic. I'm sure you, you re remember the story of NYU Langone where, where doctors and nurses were carrying people out of their rooms uh, once they lost power uh, down the steps. Uh, 20, 30 fl fl uh, flights of stairs to get them to ambulances to go to other hospitals. We're very good at that. What we're not good at is rebuilding afterwards. There are still people who lost uh, their homes during Hurricane Sandy and are waiting for help to rebuild. It's not just here that we have those impacts. When you see a forest fire in the West, when you see flooding of rivers in the Midwest, one of the problems we have now is with more people living in more places, it's not just that there are more intense storms, it's that we're now in the pathway of exposure and destruction where we weren't 50 or 100 years ago, and we're more vulnerable. And what I mean by that is our homes now, uh, uh, talk about my little bungalow in Long Beach. Uh, in 1938, there was a flood, a uh, big hurricane in, in uh, Long Island, the Long Island Express, they called it. And, uh, but the, the house that I have had wooden walls and very little power, and I think they had an outhouse, okay? By the time I got it, it had drywall, had lots of electricity, and so the first thing that happened is we had to take all the walls out of the ground floor because they were saturated with water. That's because of our, mo of our modern lifestyle. That's because we have a lot more electricity and a lot more power and energy use in our homes. So, we have made ourselves more vulnerable. Now we have to figure out a way to make ourselves more resilient. Uh, and part of what we have to do is ensure our, our homes and our businesses uh, with a form of federal insurance for reconstruction. The reconstruction that took place after Hurricane Sandy depended on Congress to refund FEMA. And that took a long time and a lot of uncertainty, a bad way to go. A sustainable economy can be compatible with economic growth but only if we do a better job of understanding and managing environmental impacts. So the institute that I work in, the Earth Institute, was a creation of the university to take all the parts of the university to work on the problem of global sustainability. If you think about Columbia University, it starts as Columbia College, it's downtown, uh, they did the great you know, liberal arts, 20 or 30 students, including Alexander Hamilton. Then through the 19th century, you see the development of professional schools, uh, medicine, law. Our engineering school actually was called the School of Mines, and its first great project was to figure out how to dig into Manhattan bedrock so they could build the New York City subway system. Universities were about helping to address the social and economic problems of their day. That's what professional schools did. 
Flash forward to the end of the 20th century. How do we deal with sustainability? We need law, politics, ecology, engineering, health, all brought together. Our university structure didn't work too well for that because we have separate places and uh, universities are like everything else, they're stovepiped, and so each organization didn't talk to each other. So we created a university-wide enterprise called the Earth Institute. We've now created educational programs and research centers, uh, research centers in each of these areas, climate, ecosystems, health, poverty, food, all of these areas, to try to work on this problem of global sustainability. I see tremendous energy, young people and scholars and faculty all working together to use our brains to solve these problems. These are tough problems, but they're solvable problems. They're problems that in some ways may seem unprecedented of huge scale, but I believe that we have the power and we have the ingenuity to solve them. And so I think that uh, the future will allow us to solve these problems. The transition to sustainability requires that we figure out ways of increasing the size of our world economy without increasing its impact on the planet. And it means a different kind of set of consumption. So I'll conclude with what I mean by that. First, a story. When I went to college, I loaded up my car with my records. I had you know, vinyl records and my hi-fi and a bunch of books, filled up my trunk, and I had a few clothing items. When I took my oldest daughter to college, she had more music and more information in her laptop and in her iPod than I had in my whole trunk. Much less material consumption. You may remember Blockbuster Video. We used to go and get videos and then we got DVDs. Now it comes streaming to you. No plastic, no packaging. Same information, better, you know, more entertainment. So a world where you have social interaction, stimulation, physical fitness, wellness, all of those kinds of activities that people are engaged in, that's part of the sustainable economy. That's part of the activities that people are engaged in that add to the GDP. So when you go to Starbucks and you sit there and you chat with your friend for an hour and happen to drink a latte at the same time, you're adding to the GDP. And so those are the kinds of activities that we're gonna see more and more of. Intellectual stimulation, lifelong education, more entertainment, more information. The average person is now spending a lot more of their time reading and absorbing information. Now what's happening in these little nano bits that sometimes drive me crazy because I write books, but just the same, that's the future. And that is compatible with a planet that doesn't destroy itself. And so that's really the, the last word I will give you. I'm very optimistic we're gonna solve the problems of sustainability, the heart of its energy, and using our brains. I'd be happy to take any questions anybody would like to ask.